Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Zero to Hear podcast. I am your host, Denny Duma. On tonight's show, how do we introduce this guy? Um, TV star. <laughs> Let's go with that. Maybe stand-up comedian in the future. We talk a little bit about that. Todd Talbot from uh, HGTV's Love It or List of Vancouver. Uh, he's a very smart guy. He's not uh, super involved in real estate sales, but very involved on the... Um, home renovation and real estate investment side. We get into a bunch of detail on that. Chat a little bit about the show. Uh, Didn't go into too much detail about the relationship with Jillian and his uh, track record on the show. He seems to think it's a little bit better than uh, what we're seeing on TV, but uh, had a great conversation. He is a super uh, intelligent real estate guy in greater Vancouver and doing big things on the TV scene as well. Uh, Enjoy the show. Hey, Steve. Hey, Steve. (laughs) Well, that was an interesting start. (laughs) Todd Talbot, thanks for coming on the show this evening. Um, I'm excited. So am I. I feel like we have a lot in common in the real estate world, so I'm excited to see where this goes. All right. Let's journey together. First, okay, something happened to me yesterday. I want to bring it up and more to provide some value for our listeners. I work often from Starbucks in between showings and appointments. Yes. I don't know if you frequent Starbucks to work or not and bring your laptop, but it is of ultra importance to first of all, scan the room and pick a good person to sit beside. I made that mistake yesterday and it's something I'll never do again. Usually I try to find a table by myself because I'm there for 30 minutes and I'm trying to bang out paperwork or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Sat at a communal table, communal table because there was nothing available. It was rough. I didn't get much done. Um, it started with this gentleman asking me, or he said he sat. I sat down and he's like, "Hey, you look like a teacher." You I'll do take look, that as a compliment. You Thank do you look very like much. a teacher. Studious. Yeah, like that. Very. And then he progressed into his political beliefs, both Canadian and us for 30 minutes and it was everything from how much he hates trudeau (laughs) into how much he hated trudeau's dad into how much he loves donald trump you should have invited this guy on your podcast i actually took his number no i'm just kidding that would have been great though (laughs) (laughs) i hope i'm half as entertaining as this dude this dude was wild have you ever had an experience like that even just like well i have a slightly different experience where, <laughs> you know, um, interesting people stop me and ask me questions about my life and my career and my television show and all those kinds of things. So I guess the the short answer is yes. Um, I don't normally sit in Starbucks uh, and pop my computer out and kind of open myself up to those conversations, <laughs> but um, more of a drive through guy. I'm probably going to be sitting in the front seat of my car next next time. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Have you ever done stand-up? I've never done stand-up. Have you Uh, thought about it? I have thought about it very, uh, I don't know, very lightly, I guess. (laughs) Um, I think stand-up is probably one of the hardest things you could ever take on. It's it's probably one of the most vulnerable things you could ever do. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, and I I pride myself on having done a lot of, you know, put myself in some vulnerable positions in terms of performing and and really kind of pushing myself to try new things. Uh, But stand-up has not, I've been invited. Have you? I've never, um, I've never, um, I've never taken up the invitation that, you know, I've started to kind of, I don't actually write any of these things down, but I've, <laughs> I've started to kind of like think in terms of stand up comedy bits. And from what I can tell is that, you know, start jotting those things down and working them into different um, jokes. There is, there's one joke that <laughs> this, like, honestly, I've, I've shared this with one person. Um, 
there's something like I fly a lot. I tr- I travel a lot. And so what I've noticed is that anytime that there's a delay on a plane, there's something to do with the luggage compartment. <laughs> and it's universal. Like it doesn't matter where you're flying or what time of day. It's, you know, the the uh, pilot comes on in a very calm and relaxed voice, making you feel like nothing is wrong. And he says, you know, I'm sorry, folks. Uh, thank you for flying with us. But we have, we're going to be delayed about uh, 20, 25 minutes. It's nothing, nothing urgent. Just, just a latch on the luggage compartment. <laughs> and then like a week later, I hear the same, the same excuse. Is it true? I don't know. I've not worked in a punchline to this joke, but you know, that, that kind of thing. That's where my brain goes. Carl laughed. And I like being, I like being funny. Um, uh, I like making people laugh. You know, it was a really um, strategic choice by me in terms of the guy that I portray on Love It or List It. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt that it was important to keep the ideas of, um, you know, families kind of trying to figure out what they're doing um, I, like I think real estate should be a fun journey for people. And while the stakes are high, I get that. Um, I think laughing with people, it, you know, it breaks down barriers. Um, and you know, who doesn't like to smile and laugh and we, and we probably don't do enough of it. And so professionally, I think it's, it's great. You know, my career in theater, um, I tend to play more you know, characters more on the comedic side of things. Um, And I tried to bring flavors of that to love it or list it. And I think it's been reasonably successful. It's super, my jokes are super cheesy on that show. Anyways, (laughs) I would like to think I'd like to be like Ellen where, you know, she has been, you can tell, you know, with her television show, she has created this brand where she's, you know, very generous and very kind. And it's always fairly clean, quote unquote, and yet she did her stand up recently. And I think, I think, I don't know for sure, but I think that part of that motivation was to say, hey, look, there are other, um, you know, there are other elements to me. I'm not just your daytime television show host. That's one element, mm. but I also mm. am, um, you know, she can be, um, raunchy and and controversial and and those types of things so do you think when you're on daytime tv or something well obviously ellen is in the spotlight um do you think she almost feels like she's restricting herself so she kind of got sick of that and needed to do something yeah 100 percent. Right? you just articulated herself. what i was trying to say yeah yeah i i think that's totally true and i think that that goes I think that's uh, across the board with people. I think it's human nature. Um, but I think if you're in kind of a performance, you know, if, if you're an actor or you're hosting or you're, you know, doing daytime television or something like that, um, you know, you really do have to play kind of a certain kind of narrow um, perspective. And that's not really what people are like. And so over the years, you kind of go, hey, look, you, you're kind of, you know, rage against the machine. You're like, look, there's more to me than just this. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's an internal battle that we all kind of struggle with, but I know I do 100%. Um, social media is great for that because you can kind of post anything you want and you mm-hmm. can tell your own story there. Um, but yeah, I think anytime that they're, you know, you're on network television, let's say, um, there are going to be restrictions. You know, you, you, you can't, bite the hand that feeds you so to speak Uh, you have to kind of play by the rules and and that uh, that's the case everywhere you know if you're working at if you're an accountant at pricewaterhouse coopers you know you there is a code that you will follow um and then you just have to decide whether that's something you want to continue to do i don't know if you know this but i had a uh, short stint in well okay have you done stand-up comedy no, I don't think I'm that funny. Okay, I think I, See, I think sw- I'm like, self awareness is the is the is the best part of this. I like to be light and sarcastic, but I don't know if I'm that funny. Right, but I was a pretty good actor back in the day. I had a uh, I probably had twenty seconds of screen time in uh, American Pie Seven. 
I didn't even know they made a seven. They did, and they made a six, five, and four too. That no one, no one knew. <laughs> did they really? Yes. First, a second year university. I've heard of one and two. Yeah, it's called Book of Love. You should look it up. It was it was quite good. Yeah, I'll get right yeah. on that. <laughs> I think it was the seventeenth minute. It, there was like a basketball scene. I was playing basketball at UBC at the time. Okay. <laughs> so they asked like a bunch of us to come and be the extras, <laughs> and so we were there for I don't know eight or nine hours on set, just sitting and eating basically all day. Yeah. And we were on set for maybe 45 minutes and we literally just scrimmage back and forth. And yeah. Like, all right. Thanks guys. How much yeah. you make? Uh, like at that time, I'm sure. Like 25 bucks an hour or something like that. Oh, okay. So not great. <laughs> well, that was 12 I, years ago. Yeah. And when you're. As a university student, I thought absolutely. that was sweet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So not bad. Yeah. I made 250 bucks and we're sitting there and eating all day. Yeah. It wasn't that bad. Uh, but I did hit a jump shot in the, in the actual movie. So. I Amazing. think I've got potential. I think you do. Maybe watch the movie and get back to me. On <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll send you some notes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe send it to your agent. Yeah, I want they, it. See what they Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I want to ask you about, and I like understanding where these types of mindsets come from, you seem like a pretty optimistic, positive dude. Where does that, is that a conscious behavior? Is that just kind of ingrained in you as a child? Where does that kind of stuff come from? Oh, man. I wish I knew, um, you know, a great scientific answer to that. I think there's, first of all, it's a great question. Um, I think that there's a few things. I think part of it is, I, I don't know about the DNA part. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm sure that that plays a certain role in your disposition. Um, but I, I can tell you that from a nurture perspective, like my parents are um i would say very similar very optimistic you know always looking for opportunities to uh take a situation and either learn from it um or frame it in a positive way um you know i don't think i always embraced that positive attitude completely especially when i was younger um and i'll give you a I'll give you a couple of examples. I remember I used to, when I was young, I think kind of my early teens and maybe like when I was like 11, 12, 13, I used to be bugged about like from my family, from my grandparents, when they would ask me a question, I would say, okay, you know, it was very, it was non-committal. Um, so that's kind of one, and maybe that's just growing up. Um, but I remember I, I had a roommate, um, we lived in Kits and, um, you know, his advice to me um, was, you know, Todd, if you would say great, when people asked you how you were doing, eventually that would start to kind of like reverse engineer into your being. And, uh, I thought he was full of shit. And, um, but I did take his advice and I, you know, I, I, I tried it for a while and I think, um, I'm, I'm really conscious about the impact that I have on other people. So I think that that's, that's part of it. I also think that you can train yourself to manifest that positivity. Um, and, and part of it is through the language that we use. I don't always feel positive, but there's something about leading with positive language that kind of drags your, your being into positivity. Um, and everyone kind of ebbs and flows, but... You know, if you, 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 there's also a, a, I guess, a little bit of a responsibility around um, if you do have, you know, some, some public profile and people are listening to what you have to say, I do think that, you know, you, you have a choice. You know, what, what do you want to put out there in the world? Um, you could lean into railing against something and ranting and, you know, or you could lean into the positive side. And, um, you know, I, tr I try and look at that from, from all elements, whether it's being a father and raising kids or um, being proactive and positive about, you know, my relationship with my wife. Um, I even, you know, go so far as to say that there's a lot of negative rhetoric in the real estate world. And, and I think that it's damning to a certain degree um, and I think that there's ways to attack big issues like affordability and all these types of things 
shifting our focus a little bit um, and framing it from more positive. Like, what can we do? What can we take responsibility for? And I'll finish by saying that, um, you know, I, I do run my life. I, I try to run it all the time from the perspective of being, you know, 100% responsible. So, um, which is just, you know, it's just an empowering place to be, um, you know, always responsible for things. But, um, but when you, when you're thinking that way, then you're like, all right, I get to choose, you know, I get, I get to choose to wake up tomorrow and do X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, you know, I've been super lucky in my career that, that I've been able to choose things that I'm passionate about. And, And maybe that's, that's part of it as well. Like I just, I really designed my career around things that I liked. Um, and so for the most part, um, uh, you know, I get, I get joy and fulfillment from, from my job. And so when I'm working and when I'm not working and, uh, and that feeds into it a little bit as well. That answer your question? Yeah. There's a lot of good shit in there. (laughs) (laughs) I'm getting old too. Right. So I'm getting to that point in my life where. What is old though? I don't know. I mean, who knows? Um, it, you know, I'm 45. And so I had, you know, my, my perspective and, and the way that I'm thinking has shifted. I've, I've yeah. noticed it shifting in the last few years. And, you know, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm in the middle now. Like if I get 90 good years, I think I'm doing great. Like, I think we're all doing great. Um, and so, you know, you start to kind of evaluate what you want out of the next five, 10, 15 years, 20, whatever it is. Um, and you also look back. I mean, it's one of the things that has challenged me about doing a, a network television show um, and then being asked to <laughs> ask hard questions. You know, you do have to, you have to kind of stop and think and be able to articulate, like, why am I doing what I'm doing? It's, mm-hmm. it's a question that's not easy to answer. Um, so I don't know. It's a, it's a great question. It's a complicated answer for mm-hmm. sure. There's a few things that I want to say maybe quickly, but I think this is an important topic to talk about. Even just the idea of having this optimistic mindset from the beginning, there's going to be bad days no matter what industry you're in, no matter what you do for a living, no matter what your family circumstances are. There's going to be bad days. But if you can trick your mind on those bad days into having a positive thought for the day, it completely shifts. And something I've found a lot of value in and you, Obviously, I don't have the public um, figure that you do, but using social media as a benefit for me has been huge. Yeah. So using it as a platform that I'm showing this positivity, but in the same way, it's helping me actually feel better. Yeah. And more optimistic, right? And, you know, social media is a, it's a a beast unto itself. Mm -hmm. Um, You can, there are lots, there's lots of negativity out there. You can find negativity. You can find people trying to leverage um, other people's anger into, you know, followers and all that kind of crazy, sick mentality. (laughs) Or you can um, lead with something more positive that also, you know, helps support your attitude, which is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I get messages sometimes i i question do i do i want to continue posting on social media like i actually do like social media but i i get burnt out of it sometimes and Mm -hmm. it's a big part of my business um and um but i get i get a lot of messages from people who like for example instagram stories um who say you know i love watching your stories because they make me smile and they you know they just kind of pick me up for the day Mm -hmm. and i'm like you know what? That's all I need to hear. I'm I'm happy to continue doing that if that's the effect. And sometimes you don't know what the effect is. Like you have no idea. Um, you know, you talked about the story about meeting this guy sitting at Starbucks. You know, the fact that you listened to him and, you know, maybe you took an interest in what he was talking about and you gave him the time of day, you know, you have no idea the impact that that would have on that guy. Um, and so, you know, you post something, you put it out there positively smile at somebody when you walk down the street. I mean, I don't want to sound super sappy about this whole thing, but, um, I, you know, 
if you want to find negativity, it it's out there in spades. And um, and I think there's uh, there's room for for people and businesses that work on the opposite. I think it's interesting to s- commonly see that the negative viewpoints, the negative people are so much louder than the positive people. So I want to be that positive loud, like the loud positive guy, right? Here's the difference. Positivity and the, you know, taking the high road, it, it doesn't get as much attention. Hmm. And so it, there is drama gets more followers. <laughs> totally. Yeah. 100%. I can tell hmm. like, if I was more dramatic, you'd get more negative feedback, but you'd also get more people. If you stir the pot, if you're a shit disturber in any way, shape or form, and trust me, I've seen it very close in my circle. I've watched people strategically use that, whether they admit it or not. And to different degrees, you want to play that game, you will, you can fast forward your, um, whatever your goal is. Going Okay, starting from the beginning of this question though is, if that's the goal, if that's the angle that you're trying to, to how, how much does it affect your personal life, right? Like I'm talking about every day I'll wake up, even if I'm having a bad day, I'll think something positive or I'll be like, I'm super excited that I've got this photo shoot today. Yeah. W- whatever it is. Puts you in a little bit of a better mood. But if it's the opposite, how much does that affect you when you're doing that for six months, a year, three years? I don't know. I, I think a lot of people who are in that place are either doing it very strategically or they're, they've fallen into a pattern that they don't realize that they're in. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that there's some unconscious behavior that goes on in that, in that element. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I just know that, um, you know, integrity plays a part in this as well. Like you, you, I don't know. It's it's hard to figure out. First of all, I can't answer how anyone else operates yeah. or what it does to them. Mm-hmm. But if you are, let's say, posting something that is inauthentic and you like to operate, you know, from a integral standpoint, it's going to grind against you. And For that sure. is going to take yeah. its toll. And yeah. so, you know, anything that you put out in the world that is not aligned with who you are, are or who you want to be is is a grind and that's why people are unhappy in their work that's why people are unhappy in their relationships you know that ultimately is when you know you're not being truthful i you know i I, and it's it's a daily struggle to be authentic you get you get challenged by that all the time yeah you know do you want to do this ah yeah we'll pay you lots of money but it's not quite right. You know, like it doesn't feel right. There's everyone in every business has an opportunity to just cheat a little bit and maybe make more money in the short, in the short term, Sure, Uh, make more money, be more famous, be more popular, whatever. Thought in like elementary school, like it's the same thing, man, this is very philosophical stuff. (laughs) Good. I uh, I listened to a podcast. How many? You've been on a bunch of podcasts. I have. I listened to one of them recently, and I didn't want it to be anything like that. I didn't want to just be like, "Hey, you're the love of the list of the host. How's the show?" Oh, right, right. You mean like people know the show? Yeah. People watch it. People yeah. get it. People understand how it works. It is what it is. I want to like be philosophical. <laughs> okay, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Okay, one of the things you said, though, is uh, a reason for your optimism and positivity is because you've kind of created this career path for yourself that you really enjoy. Mm. Maybe just give like a quick intro into what you're up to right now. Obviously, real estate related. Obviously, love it or list of Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, my, my career path has kind of unfolded in front of me with kind of a loose goal. Um. It's more about an idea and a feel. And people hate that answer because it's not specific <laughs> enough. It doesn't, sure. it's not a great, you know, soundbite. It's also not a great, 
uh, teaching tool. Um, but honestly, you know, I started my career as an actor in film and television when I was a teenager. Mm. I started working professionally when I was really young. And, you know, that morphed over time. Um, you know, I watched people that I worked with have, you know, massive success. I did, I did five seasons of a television show with Ryan Reynolds, you know, and Ryan's, you know, off doing his thing. I, I know he's super jealous of me right now. <laughs> um, but you know what I lost? I had a client offer on a house and kits. Yeah. That Ryan Reynolds beat us. Of course he's going to beat you. Yeah, no shit. He's when we loaded. found out it was Ryan Reynolds, we're like, yeah, we're okay, like, we don't feel We might as well just step away. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of other properties in the city. Ryan, it's all yours. Um, <laughs> what were we talking about? <laughs> oh, career path. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, my career path, if I look back at it, I go, I could never have charted this in a way. Most of the really big fundamental shifts that have happened along the way are not things that I've planned. Um, but I do, the commonality I think is um, I work bloody hard when I'm, when I get committed to something, I'm going to give you a, a stupid sports cliche, 110% doesn't make any <laughs> sense. Um, but you know, I'm going to, I'm going to give you everything that I've got within that, even if I don't like it. I'm going to give it everything that I've got. And um, I also try to um, focus on the relationships of the people that I'm working with. So those translate into other opportunities. It is truly all about who you know. And the people that you attract around you are the people that you journey with. And oftentimes that's, you know, it can be personal, um, but a lot of career is based around that. And uh, so... To say that I've designed it is not completely accurate. Um, what I'm up to now, I'm, um, we're finishing off season five of Love It or List of Vancouver, uh, which has been an epic journey. We've been filming for seven years. I had no idea it was going to last that long. I've never had a job that long. <laughs> um, you know, there's there's some other projects that we're working on kind of in that television realm that I'm super excited about. I'm not going to talk to you about them today because I'm not allowed to, but can I uh, guess? You can guess. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and maybe you'll come up with a better be, idea. I think it's going to be a Vancouver flip show. No, no. Cause I don't flip properties. Okay. So I wouldn't do, I, I try not to do things that I don't do. Okay. It's funny. Someone on social media asked me about flipping houses. Uh, are you going to flip that property? Because I'm renovating a house right now. You're going to flip that property. I was like, no, I don't flip property. I have, but it's not It's not the way that I invest in real estate. Mm -hmm. And the irony of that is that flipping shows are massive, massive right? Yeah. Like if you want to embrace that, yeah. you, you can, You, I'm sure you could do a show on flipping real estate. But it's not what I do. And I frankly don't even believe in it. So... Um, so I wouldn't do that is the short answer. Especially in a city like Vancouver. Well, it doesn't make any sense. Like property values are so high. The risk is huge. Exactly. I'm yeah. all about mitigating risk. Yeah. Like, and so if your game is to flip properties, you are rolling the dice. Like real estate, generally speaking, is a long-term hold commodity. So that you have the ability to manipulate and add value to. So the flipping phenomenon um, kind of annoys me really in a way. Um, it's, it's counterculture. Um, uh, you know, will they shoot a show about flipping in Vancouver? Maybe, but will it be authentic? No. Yeah. <laughs> like, cause people aren't doing that. Plus you can't do it here right now anyways. Um, so there's, there's other opportunities in the in the film and television realm, kind of in this non-scripted world, we'll call it. And then, um, and things that kind of I'm at the source of. So I'm really passionate about that. I'm really passionate about working with people that I like. That's my whole, that's my whole mantra these days. I just want to work with people that I like. Um, and if we make something great, fantastic. And if we make something shitty, so be it. As long as we had a great time, we poured our heart and soul into it, and, and, you know, we enjoyed each other in the journey. Uh, that, that to me is a winning formula. 
we have a we have a real estate business um, kind of in two parts. You know, we we do help uh, clients buy and sell real estate. I I don't personally get involved like on the day to day level. Depending on who it is, I'm involved, but I have a team of people who take care of that, uh, which is awesome. Um, and and frankly, they're 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 in the know, in the moment doing that. I just can't do it. Like, it's just not practical. Um, I have a real estate portfolio that I'm super passionate about. That's, you know, my personal portfolio. Um, I'm an investor first and foremost. I, I, I would say if you had to kind of put me in a category of real estate, um, I'm really fascinated with that conversation, but I'm more fascinated about a conversation around affordability and families and the space that we're living in and how we're designing these spaces. I've spent a lot of years uh, observing. I've got a whole lot of information about how people are living in their homes, and I'm not convinced that we are on the right path. Um, and I think that there needs to be a new conversation about that. And I think that, um, you know, boldly, I want to be part of that, like spearheading that conversation. I, I'm not greedy about it. I welcome anyone else to that conversation who can help move it along. But uh, but that I'm super passionate about. I do a lot of speaking engagements. I travel across Canada, the United States, talking to um, lots of different people about <laughs> lots of different topics, mostly in the real estate realm, renovation, design, buying, selling, investing, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm a dad. I've got two young kids. I'm married. Um, we've got three properties that are in process of construction right now. Um, we're, we're, you know, as of what day is it today? May 20th, just so contact 22nd, 2019. You know, a lot of people are feeling a little, um, skittish about the market I'm buying. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. Um, I like to put my money where my mouth is. If I'm going to talk about something, I'm going to have to live it as well. I, I can't stand listening to people talk about things that they actually don't do. <laughs> it drives me bananas. Um, we have we have a lot of partnerships that we work with different companies. Um, I'm super, you know, it's been an interesting journey to figure that piece out. There's a lot of opportunities to work with different companies. Um, I think we've, We've worked really hard. Like I've got a great team of people who work with me um, and we've managed to align ourselves with companies that have shared values that we really believe in. We're launching a new website that I think will be hopefully really interesting. I'm going to compete with you. We're going to have a podcast. I mean, there's just, there's so <laughs> many things. Um, I'd like to play more golf. I skied one day this year, which is ridiculous because uh, I love skiing. <laughs> So, you know, the balance is a little out of whack, um, but, um, you know, I, I'm doing my best. I'm sure I'm forgetting something. It's a lot. Like, it's like, I, I feel like my career is kind of like a, you know, a smorgasbord. Like, I, I try and run around and keep all these dishes warm at the same time. And um, part of me loves that. I love that frenetic energy. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like I've got a lot of energy to put towards things. Um, um, yeah, so th there's a lot going on. Did you get out of that, Carl? <laughs> yeah, yeah. In yeah. the podcast notes, it's going to be Todd Talbot, and then it's going to be like four <laughs> paragraphs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's a cool, okay, it's a cool idea to build a career around the stuff that you love, right? Yeah. So oh, and con by the way, so in the last seven years, I've never been able to go back and do anything scripted. So that yeah. is my like that that's who i was am i don't even know anymore um so there's been lots of really fun conversations about opportunities to come back especially in the live theater realm and look for an opportunity that would <laughs> that i would feel comfortable coming back at um but it's uh i'm really excited about bringing some of that back into the fold it's tricky because of time right like mm -hmm. there's just only so many hours in a day you obviously housing affordability in greater vancouver is a big topic recently you mentioned you'd like to be part of 
the change, the future. Yeah. What, like what few highlights are worth talking about in terms of how do we create more affordability in this city? Because it seems like from my perspective, being in the industry, it seems like municipalities are against it. Like in terms of, of putting permits through yes, to build more product. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, you can be, you can be bold about it. I yeah. mean, the city of Vancouver is completely pooped. Like, yeah. First of all, being positive about the situation. So mm-hmm. why we don't address the low lying fruit of this problem is, I don't know, confuses me. Uh, first of all, we attack it from a, a political realm, which is really a response to people's outrage. So yeah, exactly. is it necessarily the right measure? And anytime you bring in a certain, let's say a certain tax, it's going to have certain effects that are um, predicted, and then it's going to have certain effects that are unpredicted. Um, They're really broad strokes. It's like going in and trying to do fine finishing work with a sledgehammer. It's going to have side effects that you didn't want. And we're seeing that. Exactly. You know, Mm. you change the mortgage rules to increase affordability, and all of a sudden you've got first-time buyers who are struggling to get enough equity to put down on a place and now all of a sudden you you add a stress test on top of that and from what i've seen it's actually attacking the low end of the market far greater than you know kind of um dampening the top end so that doesn't make any sense to me you you identified one the permit process so i mean i don't know how simplistic we need to make it but the fact that you have to wait. So for instance, today I have been adding a front porch to my property, which, um, so that we can use our front door. This is a house that I, <laughs> that I renovated a year and a half ago. I've been waiting for a permit for that for close to eight months. It's asinine. Then they make me put, um, orange tree barriers around two trees that aren't even on my property, nor are they in front of my property. So we did that. Then they failed us because we didn't put a fence across the entire property at the back, right at my back door. So these little things, while are slightly annoying, I get it. It's not a big deal, but they add up. They discourage homeowners from playing by the rules. So now we've got renovations that are being done without permit which is fine if you're if you're doing it to code but the permit process is there to protect people so you're lessening the value of your property and as you know uh has this renovation been done you know you go to sell a place or help them has this renovation been done with permits no what's your first thought okay it's sketchy that's everyone's first (laughs) reaction right even if it's done beautifully um so these little barriers right and then People have to hold a piece of property until they can get a permit to do it. Like it, the trickle down effect is ridiculous. So that absolutely needs to be fixed. And it's so easy. It's so easy. It's, you're going to get me all riled up. You're here. preaching the choir, man. I know. I know. So those things, absolutely. But I think that there's a bigger conversation to be had around um, where we're living and the types of of homes that we're living in. And this is a massive conversation. I could talk about this for five hours. So (laughs) cut me off. But, you know, we have bought into this idea that first of all, bigger is better. Bigger is the solution to your problems. Everyone thinks that square footage is the answer. Well, have we really thought about all the crap that's in your house or the layout, the design? I mean, you can walk into... As you know, you're in the industry, you walk into a 2,000 square foot house, let's say, um, and you could walk into two different ones. And one will feel like 2,800 square feet with amazing functionality and elements that bring a ton of natural light, maybe higher ceilings, just maximizing that space in a way from a design and architectural perspective that allows the people who live in there to enjoy that space that much more. You can walk into the equivalent space that's 2,000 square feet um, and it feels like it's, you know, 1,500 square feet or 1,200 square feet because it's choppy and, 
you know, it's dark and all of these elements that play into people's experience in there. So what we're building and the fact that real estate has gotten so expensive, people have been able to build things without much thought. I used to believe that contractors, developers built with the end user in mind so that they were trying to create spaces that that worked for individuals, couples, families. That's, I don't believe that anymore. Mm -hmm. I believe that they are way behind the curve. They're selling into an idea and then people get into these homes and they realize that the space either doesn't work for them or they bought way too much space. People buy generally, well, I shouldn't say generally speaking, there's a lot of people who buy big houses because they think that that's what they need. And we've gone on a personal journey in the other direction. So um, as I said before, um, you know, I've been living this. I wanted to challenge my idea about a family of four living in Vancouver, essentially cheaper than buying a house an hour and a half outside the city that is 3,000 square feet with a two-car garage and all these things. And then we start buying stuff and we fill up our house. And all of a sudden, we're you know up to our eyeballs in debt. Everyone's pressurized. Relationships are fa falling apart because people are commuting for four hours a day and you don't get to see your children. And I mean, it is, you pull at this string and it's it just goes on and on and on. So what we're building, the idea of, Someone needs to stand up and show that you can live in 1,500 square feet as a family of four and be perfectly happy. In fact, I think you could actually be happier than double the square footage. Square footage scares me. Well, I, don't, I mean, people don't understand that when you buy a big house, you just, not only do you have to buy, pay for the purchase price of it, but then you also have to maintain it. You have to furnish it. You have to clean it. Like, these are practical elements that people don't understand you got to commute from it you got need a second car like trickle down effect is is crazy and when i talk about this so i've coined this phrase right sizing you know it's a it's a bit hokey but um you know i don't use the term downsizing because that's retirement you have to give something up i really want this to be about like having something better than not worse than not giving something up and whenever I talk about this across the country, I'm telling you, it, it is, the response is off the rails. People are dying to understand that there is a way that they can afford to stay where they want to stay and see an example of how to do it. Is it the, is it the idea that this is going to make them happier or is it the idea that this is going to make my friends think I'm something greater than I'm not Yeah, type of thing. Right. Yeah. And that's what bugs me. That's mm -hmm. like whenever you meet with new people, there was like, okay, my budget's this. Okay. Well, <laughs> how much do you want to spend? I, I don't really care what your budget is. I'm like, how much do you want to spend? Yeah. Do you want to spend the max absolute max and, eat craft dinner and Mr. Noodles like and never travel or do you want to like have the lifestyle that you like right and work within that lifestyle right it's just uh it's I backwards. think it's backwards yeah and I don't know exactly where that idea came, came from I, it's comes cultural from. Yeah. it's societal I mean everywhere you look we are selling you the idea that more equals happiness yeah so you're swimming upstream you're going against it but when people try it on I think um, I, there are so many examples of things. What, one of them is, like, I, lo I love mm -hmm. it when people go on vacation. Like, for example, like us as a family of four. You, mm -hmm. you know, you got, you know, four of us. Maybe we've got uh, two suitcases and everyone's got a little carry-on or whatever. And you spend, let's say, a week in Mexico or even two weeks in Mexico, if you're lucky. And you realize that you're staying in this one room or maybe two rooms. <laughs> you want for nothing. Now, granted, you're on vacation, so that's the asterisk in this example. Um, you want for nothing. You never missed anything that you had at home. Those books that are on the shelf, those 
I don't know, the, the, the scotch glasses that you thought you needed, <laughs> the, whatever crap you thought you needed. Um, you never, you never missed it at all. You get home, for example, I mean, listen, as an investor, uh, strategically, I want to own storage lockers because I know that that's where the money is. When's the last, I, most people have a storage locker or they have a garage that functions as a storage locker. And I bet you 80% of that stuff in there, if not higher, never gets used, never gets looked at. And you're just shelling out money for it to store it. And even if it's in your garage, if you're not thinking you're paying money for it, you're, you're crazy that you're paying uh, maintenance, property taxes, insurance, you know, purchase price, calculate that out. And then you tell me if it was smarter to buy that or get a, you know, 10 by 10 storage locker at whatever storage facility is out there. <laughs> but we, we, we definitely have the formula wrong. And when it comes to greater Vancouver, you know, we have a whole generation we have multiple generations who believe that it's their right to have a 33 by 122 lot within 10 minutes of the downtown core. That is our right. And people kick and scream. I don't want some, you know, densification in my backyard. I don't want a sky train. Well, I'm sorry. You know, like I've been preaching about this for a while. And, you know, I would say at least five years ago, I said, it has already changed. You just haven't realized it yet. It's, exactly. it's already done. We are, the, the, the way that Vancouver used to be ended a long time ago. And, and we need to engage people, not only in Vancouver, but any major city around the world. Travel, get out and see. We just came back from three weeks in Europe. London, Paris, Barcelona. Never saw one detached house yeah. in any of those three cities. And you'd kill to live in any of them. They're amazing. And yet here, we are so precious about our little front yards. By the way, anyone listening, what do you do in your front yard? <laughs> what do you do? You don't do anything there. So wasted space. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I, like I said, I could go on for hours, but. I don't even there. know if I want to live in a house. Like. I'm tw I'm well. I just turned thirty. Getting up oh, there, baby. Getting up there. Uh, I don't even know if I want to live in a house. I like strata living. I don't want to cut a lawn. I don't want to clean gutters. So I yeah. don't really understand why that entitlement to owning a piece of land in Vancouver exists, even. And yeah. maybe it's maybe it's like a a little bit older people than me that kind of grew up a little bit differently. I, so I just finished presenting to a uh, an investment firm about investing in real estate. And I am like, maybe not, maybe you're the leading edge of this conversation being 30. Um, but I look at my kids who are not 30, um, but they're, you know, they're seven to 10. They're going to be 25 before you know it, right? And I don't think they're going to want to own a piece of real estate. Yeah, I mean, they might just because, you know, who their dad is and who their mom is. Like we, we can't, we like the game, right? So, but generally speaking, owning things to that generation. And I think a younger generation represents um, a lack of freedom. And I don't think that mm. it's needed. People are like, I don't need to own a car. When I grew up, if you didn't have a car when you were 16, you were a loser. Like you, you, I got my driver's license the day I turned 16. Now, people don't even want their driver's license. I mean, you got Uber, not here, of course, <laughs> but it will come. It's coming. Yeah. You got coming. Airbnb, like these types of things that are clunky right now, give it 10 years. You know, we work, you know, has launched, we live. These types of scenarios are going to advance and they're going to advance really fast. The old model live. is. I didn't know that. Do you know that? Oh yeah. They've also got I can't remember what the school version is, but they've got We Teach, maybe. Um, and they're not the only example. There's lots of stuff out there in the world that you know, look, strata living, I agree with you, it appeals to me as well. Mm. Um, 
In fact, we looked for a three bedroom condo in Vancouver oh, really? that we could buy. <laughs> we 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 lost out on one that we thought could work, but finding, as you know, finding a three bedroom condo or any strata property that's designed efficiently for a family in this city is impossible. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. And if you find one based on supply and demand, you're you know, you're way overpaying for it <laughs> because developers don't build them. There's no mandate to build family housing. Now, people will argue with me and say, well, there's townhouses. Okay, so you got 1,500 square feet spread out over three floors and stairs in the middle. Is that yeah. the most efficient, effective way to design housing in the city? I don't think so. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a really interesting conversation, and I think it's going to change a lot faster than people realize. Um, we need to, we need to re, you know, fly into Vancouver, look down. If you think you're a big city, it's, we are so small. We're, we're, we're in our adolescence. Like we're like 12 years old and we're kind of clumsy. We haven't got things sorted out, but we think we're really great and we know everything, which is, you know, the quintessential 12 year old. And then, <laughs> and then look from the airplane down at the amount of detached housing that we have in this city. Now, listen I am part of this is from a sustainability standpoint. So I am not necessarily advocating to pave Vancouver and put high rises everywhere. There are ways to do this that are much more sustainable. The fact that we're tearing down houses that were built in 1990 is, uh, should be extremely embarrassing to this community. And we should be building stuff that is going to stand the set test of time. The, the single biggest producer of waste into our landfill is from the housing industry and there's no great reason for it just because we build shitty houses and we tear them down quickly because the land value is so high with single family homes often my advice when people when you meet with a new new client who wants to buy in the city and they're saying well we really we'd prefer newer we feel like it's safer like honestly I would steer towards those 50s and 60s bungalows. They're built way better. They usually have better layouts. You do some cosmetic updates, it's a much better home. It's embarrassing. Yeah. And I never really looked at it that way. It's more just like, oh, this is what people build here. Right. The early 2000s and late 90s for single family home construction was so bad. Just these two level stucco boxes. Because it's with, all about the money. Exactly. It's about speed yeah. and money. And people weren't discerning enough to go, you know what? No, this isn't what we want. We want something that's higher quality. Either people don't know, which is part of the problem, exactly. or there isn't another option. And then people are panicked because, well, it's multiple offer situation. So, of course, we've got we to gotta get in there and compete for something that may or may not be the right fit. But I think the conversation, just to bring this full circle, is about empowering people to understand how they actually use their space and the lifestyle that they live. And instead of buying the house so that you live into this idea that you think you want, know how you actually live and find the property that supports that lifestyle. We get it backwards, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Totally. I completely agree. And I preach that to clients all the time. Uh, we can't do a podcast without quickly talking about love real estate. Sure. And I don't want to know. We can talk about it as long as you want. I know you could. <laughs> I want to open by saying. You're going to edit this down to about 15 seconds. <laughs> I feel like you on the show are like a goaltender in soccer in a penalty shootout. <laughs> I feel like you are just put there to lose all the time. What is your win percentage? 10%? No, it's it's higher than that. It's probably 55, 45, 60, 40. No something way. like that. I've seen a lot of the shows. Uh, listen, <laughs> it, it is what it is, but you're absolutely right. Here, here's the reality of the situation. So, um, well, first of all, we can't tell somebody on the show what they can or cannot totally. do yeah. after we finish like that's just ridiculous mm. so you know there there was um i 
I, I stay connected to a handful of the homeowners. Um, in fact, I just partnered with um, a couple who were on the show. We bought a piece of property together, cool. um, which is great. And uh, anyway, so I follow a few of these people on social media. Yeah. And, you know, one of the houses that we did on the show, which was gorgeous, was a heritage house. Stunning. Um, but it's up for sale. And the, the, the reason is, is that life is fluid. Like you cannot predict what is going to happen, um, you know, tomorrow, let alone six months down the road. So one of the things that I hate hearing is the idea of forever home. I, I just, I, I can't stand that idea. If you, if you end up staying in a property for your whole life, great. Fantastic. But this idea that there is a final destination is complete and utter bullshit and something that, I don't know, the media or television or somebody created at some point. Um, what's great about the show is that, you know, our, our construction crews are awesome. Um, they're highly accountable, obviously. They're on television. Um, we definitely add value to the properties that are on the show and that I can stand behind. So I think that's awesome. Whatever people choose to do at the end of the day um, really ultimately makes no difference to me. I'm just giving you a hard time. No, right. I know. Hey, but it is funny because people <laughs> do comment on it a lot yeah. and you're like, you know, it's, that's not really what it's about. Mm -hmm. um, the thing I do like about Love It or List It is that it was designed as a show about functionality and the executive producers that created the show and they've got multiple spinoffs and shows all over the world. Like they've done extremely well with this franchise, but they all, what they said to me at the beginning of the process was this is about functionality. We don't do, and you'll notice on the show, like we don't do uh, movie rooms because that isn't something that people need to have nor do they move for um so the conversations on the show i think do showcase and 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 one of the reasons it's, it's successful is that everyone is always in this constant conversation are we living in the space that we that is working for us in the area that we need you know we're we're constantly evaluating that um, and that's kind of what the show is supposed to, um, highlight, if you will. I, I really like the show. I like the idea of the show and I think it provides a fairly realistic view into actually what happens on a day-to-day -day basis for real, like realtors, right? Is a lot of the conversation is about functionality, location. Yeah. Like we really want to stay in this neighborhood. Let's see the best thing that we can find in this neighborhood versus if you're moving 15 minutes away, you get everything you want. And then that's a decision you got to decide on. Right. So I, I like the premise of the show in terms yeah. of it being fairly realistic in terms of what real life people are yeah. going through on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, it's a highlight reel, right? Yeah. Like no one does a renovation in 42 minutes, nor do they go yeah. out house hunting and see, you know, three or four houses. Yeah. So, um, I, I do think it's supposed to be representative of the greater process that people go through. Um, you mentioned neighborhood, which I think is an, always an interesting thing. And yes, I, yeah. I kind of roll my eyes on the show when I hear people say that, because first of all, I've never heard anyone say that everyone loves their neighborhood. And so, um, but they've often moved. And so the next neighborhood that they go to Oh, this is the best neighborhood. This is the best neighborhood. I think you said that about your last one. I know, but this one's the best one. <laughs> and you're like, really? Okay, so you live over there. Your neighborhood's the best. And you live over there. And your neighborhood's the best. I'm not convinced that neighborhood is as important as people make it out to be. It's just a comfort thing, right? They know where the best park is. They know where the best sure. coffee shop is. They just feel familiar with it, I think. Uh, yeah.
so familiar and the other side of that coin is kind of scared to change, exactly. right? Yeah. Um, but some of the greatest experiences for me have been moving from one location to another. Mm -hmm. uh, it opens up so many new cool opportunities. It's why people travel. And yet we don't quite do it with our principal residence. So not that I suggest you change your principal residence every two weeks. But I do think, I do think that that is overrated. Now, if your kids are in school, I get it. You know, yeah. you don't want to move them and stuff like that. But when it comes to adventuring outside of your quote unquote neighborhood, I don't, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think I, it can be a, a, a hugely positive thing. I agree. And I've fallen victim to it as well. I used to live in New West for five years. Didn't want to move, move to Burnaby. And now I love it. it yeah, exactly. Like, my point. Right? No, it is. You are proving my point. But it's really, for me, I think it was familiarity. Yeah. Right. You just know exactly where everything that you do that uh, is part of your lifestyle, you know yeah. exactly the best spot to do. If you're a kickboxer, you know where the best gym is, you know, like. Yeah. It's uh, people don't like change. For sure. Yeah. I'm the opposite. I'm like, if I'm going to a kickboxing gym, which I'm not, clearly, look <laughs> at me. Um, you know, I'm constantly thinking, at some point I want to go to another kickboxing gym. Because that's going to be a different experience. And I want to experience that. I don't want to go through my life doing kickboxing at one gym. I want to go to another gym. And... Have that shake it up a little bit. Um, and, you know, I think I think that's the whole purpose. Of, not the purpose of living, but, you know, as part of the excitement of living is to change it up. Is to learn something new. Yeah. Don't get so precious about the whole thing. Your house, it's not precious. <laughs> Someone lived there before you and you thought the previous one was precious. I mean, you know, the styling of a house is can be personal and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the house itself, we, we give it too much credit. Mm. It's just a house, just a car. It's overrated. The one other comment I wanted to make about the show is, yeah. again, fairly realistic in terms of real life. Seems like every renovation has an issue or <laughs> something comes up that is unexpected, right? Of course. That's real life. That you've, is real. You've life. done a ton of renos. I've done a ton of renos. I'm currently going through my first big one that yeah. wasn't painted floors. That doesn't really count. But going through a big one that is an entire house removed an oil tank, all, drain tile. Oh yeah, good stuff. Yeah, right? that's all true. all the electrical. Yep. Yeah, it's yeah. fun. It's fun. You learn a ton. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of unexpected. There's usually yeah. not one thing. There's usually multiple things a week. <laughs> What have oh, you, yeah. I guess, what advice would you give for people who are maybe scared of doing a reno or haven't done one? You have to embrace that. Yeah. First of all, like you have to know, and um, there's going to be challenges. I think that you're, you're, if you're GCing your project or, or doing it yourself, or you are managing the person who is GCing your project, um, you have to understand that you are a problem solver. That's it. That's your job. You're making choices and you're problem solving. And you need to bring a certain level of creativity and lightness to the process. The other thing is, is that there's no right answer. Mm -hmm. Now, an electrician listening to me is going to argue, yes, there is a right and wrong way to wire something. I understand that. But when it comes to making choices about, you know, whether... The door should be framed six inches to the right or to the left. I mean, these are the little things that that you're presented with all the time. Or, you know, the 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 sill is rotted out. Now we have to change it. Do we want to add a bigger window? You know, like all of these things are just flying at you all the time. And it's hard for people who are working full time and they do two renovations in their entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. So it's overwhelming. There's like you can get exhausted by making choices for sure. Um, it's one of the reasons why people come on the show. A, a lot of them come on the show because they're just like, you know what? I don't want to. I'm busy. <laughs> you make the choices. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for people to understand that 
that is normal. That's the normal process. Because I think when they're presented with these problems, then they start to feel like, oh, there's something wrong. No, there's nothing wrong. If you do not have a problem, your contractor does not come to you with (laughs) issues. I would be asking questions or sitting there and watching because that is just the nature of it. And it's fun and it's exciting and it's creative. Um, You know, the cliche double the time, double the budget didn't happen for for no reason. (laughs) I mean, I've been doing this for over 20 years and I still, I I still can't manage my timeline. I'm way too optimistic. (laughs) I can manage the budget a little bit better, but the timeline I'm horrible. Horrible. We didn't mention this at the beginning. Carl renovates homes for a living. Oh, do you? Wow. What percentage of uh, jobs have an unexpected uh, turn, Carl? 100%. <laughs> right. There's always something, and that yeah. something leads to something else. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at it as an opportunity, too, like sometimes you can, you can spin those things into the positive mm-hmm. where you go, okay, well, You know, we had to open this wall, but there was no insulation in there. So now we get to make our home more efficient. Mm -hmm. Um, And, or, you know, whatever whatever the example is, there's a million of them. Um, But there's a nimbleness to, there's a flexibility inside of renovation. I think the other big, the other big misnomer or myth out there is that there's a right way and a wrong way. Um, There isn't. You... You make it up as you go along and you, you rely on the people around you who hopefully have a certain level of experience and ask questions. Like there is no shame. Like I said, I've been doing this for over 20 years and man, I, everyone I hire, I'm watching them like a hawk. I'm like, why are you using that? I've never used that tool before. What is that? And they're like, oh, this is the best new thing. I'm like, I haven't seen that. Now all of a sudden I want that tool. And that's where I'm a bit of a, you know, I do have a full garage of tools, but, <laughs> um, but I think that's a phobia. A lot, a lot of people have though, is they're because maybe they're less experienced. Someone's like yourself, who's done it for 20 years, who is still able to ask questions and understands that you don't know everything. Yeah. But people that have never done it before, or maybe done one, I think are fearful of looking stupid. Right? Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Or buying a house, like asking questions about a mortgage. Yeah. I mean, listen, mortgages change so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> The rules, the approval, the rates, uh, what's going on behind the scenes. If you're not a mortgage broker dealing with that on a day-to-day basis, like I feel like I know a decent amount of mortgages about a mor- mortgages. Um, I have a lot of them. I've watched a lot of people get them. I, I like the information. I read about it. I do not pretend to be an expert. When I go to get a new mortgage, I'm picking the brain of my mortgage broker like, like crazy because I want to know... Like, What's changed in the last six months? I need to know this information. Ask questions. Like that humility element. It's funny because when you're on TV, they want you to be omnipotent, right? We're supposed to know everything. Yeah. Well, it's the biggest thing that I can't stand about any genre like this. But on HGTV, like all these shows, you're flipping houses. Oh, they know everything about flipping houses. No, they don't. <laughs> no, they don't. And if you... You know, I had a quiet conversation with them. They'd be like, no, I don't know. I know some things. I do some things really well. And I rely on other people for for other elements. And I trust them. And I'm responsible for the decision ultimately. But, you know, no one knows everything. Cut yourself some slack. It's, first of all, it's supposed to be fun. <laughs> Set, renovation and buying a house. Like those things are fun. Um, and just ask questions. Start early in the process because if you pretend you know everything, it's really hard to pretend you don't once you get into the negotiation of a of a property. It's like, hey, I don't know. I haven't done this in 10 years. I'm going to ask you a thousand questions <laughs> and then just go for it. Like everyone loves that. I I feel like I'm like that and I really have no shame in terms of asking questions. My partner, James, uh, was in real estate about six years before I got in and I think I progressed pretty quickly in year one and I asked him at the end, I'm like, how, how well, how do you think I'm doing? What, what do I need to learn? Um, he's like, honestly, you've been like, you progressed way quicker than I thought. And I'm like, what's the reason for that? Like, 
I've seen other people that I went through the course with who sold two houses this year. I did seven, I sold 17 in my first year. He's like, you ask a shit ton of questions. Mm -hmm. And he's like, it's at the point where it's a bit annoying, but I'm, I'm okay (laughs) spending the extra time delivering those answers right now. Yeah. But it's literally, it's the key. Anytime you're doing something new, whether it's a renovation, whether it's purchasing a home, a mortgage, whatever it is, who gives a shit? Yeah. Ask questions. Yeah. Talk to people who know. Talk, like, I have a better beard than you, but yeah. Carl has a better beard than me. That's Carl, right. how'd you get, how did you grow it so beautiful? Uh, essential oils. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Funny. Uh, I, do, I feel like we're like, you know, the, the ape standing up. We've got like <laughs> the... the big beard <laughs> like i'm at the low end like i was like i'm the baby beard you know like middle beard granddaddy beard. <laughs> good stuff i want to grow a beard my wife doesn't like it. doesn't like it eh? i have to mm. take that into consideration that's fair you know <laughs> the wife always wins it should good yeah most of the time <laughs> are I've, you married uh not anymore not anymore. Nope. All right. You haven't done my homework yet. <laughs> um, kids? Nope. All right. That was a benefit for sure. Yeah. Um, good learning experience. Very good learning experience. About a year and a half out. Okay. And uh, I don't know if I'd change it. I think I learned more about myself in those couple of years than I would have if I didn't have that experience. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think I think looking back at anything in life and saying I would change it, you know, I, I I've thought about I've thought about those elements where you kind of like would I would I've chosen something different, knowing everything I know now mm-hmm. and what it taught me or whatever. And honestly, I can't say that I would really change much. Um, it's. Uh, Gotta get in there and and do it. Ask questions. Ask more questions before you get married next time. <laughs> <laughs> ah, fuck that. That one up didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's wrap up. But I want to. We're out of beer. Briefly, first of all. do you want another one? Of course. Yeah, lots more. <laughs> oh. uh, let's wrap up. This is a technical break. You are fairly involved in a bunch of charities right now. I want to. I am. I love, first of all, that you're using the public figureness. I don't know what adjective you use, but Platform, to yeah. to help out. What what uh, what do you like being involved in, and what what do you like about being involved in charities? Um, what do I like about being involved in charities? Well, or I think, and what are the ones that you're involved in, and and why? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of charities. We we work with. A lot of different organizations and and I think it's um it's a privilege to work with them first of all um you know it's uh like selfishly i I get exposed to so many different things that really do like literally rock your world um mm-hmm. you go to the courage to come back awards and you listen to the stories of these people, like even just thinking about it right now, the hair on the back of my neck stands up. It immediately puts into perspective your life, um, the, the, you know, the conversation around gratitude and all those things. So from a selfish standpoint, that's what I get out of it. Um, and, uh, you know, if I can help in some small way, fantastic. Um, you know there are there are so many charities out there that are worthy. I do. I'm I'm sure I'm going to forget some because uh, we work all year long with with lots of different charities. One one of the ones that I put a significant amount of time into is Covenant House, um, which kind of has two elements to it that that really spoke to me. Number one is it deals with youth who are. Um, in a position that they need some help. And uh, that that youth element of it really, um, I don't know, it, it hits home with me, you know. Uh, it might be because I'm a dad and, and I, can, I can see that, um, you know, 
if my kids for some reason needed that support system, that I would want it there for them. Um, uh, yeah. So, you know, and, and the other, the other thing that actually I learned through, um, you know, being exposed to all of this is, is this idea that no one can create and, and build upon anything without a safe place to live roof over their head, somewhere that they can call home where they, um, you know, where they're, where they're safe and they're warm and they can, you know, you can have a shower and, you know, all those really basic things that we take for granted, Mm -hmm. um, without that. So I, so I, I, I guess I'm attracted to both of those ideas. Um, and that housing element, which is obviously a massive challenge for people, especially young people who don't have a lot of money, where are they going to rent, where are they going to stay? And the spiral of not having that, that, that safety net there and then finding themselves ultimately on the street, which is devastating. Um, and hearing these young people's stories, honestly, it, 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 would, it, it changes your life forever. Uh, we do the executive sleep out. I, I host, I personally host a big uh, fundraiser um, each year that sports covenant house. Uh, in fact, we're, we're planning it now for October. I mean, it starts earlier and this will be our fifth annual year or fifth annual fundraiser <laughs> um uh yeah i mean working with uh, children's hospital um um doing some work with uh, color to conquer cancer for cancer society um we do work with uh, vgh hospital foundation i do a lot of work with them i'm the spokesperson for their lottery i also host one of their big fundraisers um the courage to come back awards um, and then there's small little charities that, uh, you know, we donate to or or donate something to mm-hmm. an experience. Um, we supported a, uh, an experience where we did a live auction item where people who bid on it get to go out uh, beer tasting with me, which, <laughs> you know, is somewhat self-indulgent. But, uh, you know, they raised a ton of money. We get to go out and, and have fun, drink some beer and, and hang out with, with some people. Um, I have no idea who they are, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, um, maybe it's time of life. I wasn't always, I didn't always have the means to do it. I didn't have the, uh, the time, the, and, and even the, the motivation when I was in my twenties and early thirties. Um, but it's an opportunity that I saw that I, you know, I, I could do it and, and stepped into it and, and it's, it's, you know, I'm hosting this uh, event tomorrow night for Anxiety Canada. Um, anxiety is like a, a massive issue that people are talking about now. Um, I don't think I personally, feel, although their definition of anxiety also includes stress. Mm. Um, you know, so there's there's different degrees of it, and I'm I, I'm going to be fascinated tomorrow night to to learn more about it. I mean, it's um, so even just little opportunities like that. Um, shape your life and uh, if you can contribute a little bit then you know great thanks so much for coming on the show (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, uh. oh oh, (laughs) wow see beginning of the stand up comedy there it is you actually had a pretty good joke in the middle there too oh did I yeah when we were talking about stand up well we got so philosophical that we you know we didn't really get into like funny but hold on a second That's the button. Do you listen to podcasts? I have listened to some. Okay. I've gotten into listening to uh, books on yeah. Audible. Similar. Um, I, you know what? To be honest with you, I, I don't listen to them, and it's mostly from a technical standpoint. I need someone to tell me how I can tap into the podcast world easily. Done. I'll do it right after. Okay. We. <clears throat> I don't want to download. Like, uh, it's like... I need like the Netflix of podcasts. You have an iPhone? Yeah. On your phone already. Okay. Let's see. This is, <laughs> listen, I can build a house, but I cannot download or access a podcast. I have listened to some and honestly, like once I get into them, I'm, I'm hooked. I just love how unfiltered they are. So that's the reason I, I listen to probably three hours of podcasts a day while I'm in the car and working out every day. Yeah. Yeah. And I've tried books on tape. I just don't like 
one, it's usually one person monotonally reading a book, which yeah. is, does not appeal to me. But the book's monotonally usually... Monotonally a word. I think, I'm pretty sure, yes. Okay, good. It's actually been sitting in my repertoire waiting to be used. Good. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I, I just don't like... They're edited. How many, right. how many different edits do they go through to make it appeal to the masses? Whereas like a candid conversation talking about whatever it is, business, life, experience, whatever it is, yep. I learn and take a lot more from. Joe, uh, the reason I brought up do you listen to podcasts is because Joe Rogan is a guy that I He's listen your to a lot right now. Yeah. And Boy, almost super successful. He has 95 million downloads a month. That's, that's why I said super successful. It's a big number. That's a big number. <laughs> and but, clearly, you know, he's tapping into something. I think, I think that that, you know, the podcast is hinting at where we're going in video form as well. For sure. Um, you know, even, you know, YouTube, Netflix, not that I want to bite the hand that feeds me, but, you know, the network model of control and like it is changing so fast now. Mm. And, and I think people are so much more attracted to authenticity whatever you know your definition of that word is you know we're all, we're always filtered to a certain degree you know even in this conversation i'm filtered there are certain elements that i will not talk about sure you know you don't want to throw your kids under the bus you know i'm always conscious of that I always want to hold them in good light so there are always filters that we put on some people don't and i think that you know well whatever but uh <laughs> but i think you're going to see it move into you know, maybe not TV per se, but into video form a whole lot more as well. It's just the the cost of doing a podcast is so much cheaper. Um, to try and get this this kind of freestyle conversation on film, even though we're filming it right now, you can't get that production value. I mean, watching two people sit and talk is it like TV's a visual medium, right? Yeah. This, you're listening, you're doing something else, you're driving, you're working out, whatever, you're going for a run. It's a great, it's a great vehicle for that. You'd be surprised how many people watch podcasts on YouTube though. I'm not necessarily that they're obviously engaged visually the whole time, but they're playing yeah. in on their computer, right? Because you listen to a lot on YouTube. Because people can just run it from their browser, right? They don't need an app to right. download or whatever. So it's just easier. Right. Do you so, listen to podcasts too? Yeah. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Yeah, yeah. Love podcast. <laughs> What's your favorite one? Oh. Answer this carefully, Carl. Present company excluded. <laughs> <laughs> I li- honestly, I listen to a lot of comedy podcasts. I just like laughing throughout the day. Mm-hmm. That, those are the best. Yeah, yeah. It just makes time go by. So is it stand-up comedians just telling jokes, doing um, their stand-up, or just like in conversation with other people? Just in, in conversation. Mm-hmm. And right. like maybe someone brings up a topic and they just have, you know, their angle. Yeah. They it's usually pretty funny. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Or they'll like share bits that they like either killed with or right. that the first Bomb. time sucked and then yeah. they had to, you know, work with it, tweak it. And then it became something really good. So it's cool to kind of hear that behind the scenes. scope. Yeah. Too. Yeah. 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 A lot of podcasts come up with uh, like, like comics come up with their material doing podcasts. So just riffing, right. Going back and forth and maybe something sticks and you write yeah. a bit and go from there. I'm telling you, the luggage latch, it, it is. It's, yeah, that was it. It's going to kill. Gold. It's going to kill. Yeah. Well, hopefully not a plane full of people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. See, I, I, I could, t- I don't know if people are interested, but I could, I could do this for four hours. What's the longest podcast out there? There's got to be long. Ones. I don't. The longest one I've ever listened to is probably around three hours. Like Joe Rogan does a bunch that are like I know two he, to like, three hours. Dude, I'm right. pretty sure he has like a five and a half. A few of them are that long. Yeah. Wow. Are there any questions on your fancy little piece of paper that you didn't <laughs> ask? Um, See, when we started off this process, you're like, how long can you stay? And now you're like, and now you're like, I got to go. No, no. <laughs> I have zero. Limit. We had a three hour one the other last week. It's hard. It doesn't feel like it, it goes by, like, I mean, it goes by so quickly. It doesn't feel so like I go, I do a lot of speaking long. engagements, right? Yeah. And the general format is, you know, I speak for 40 minutes, do 20 minutes Q&A. They want you to, like, stand on stage for an hour. I, I always stress out about material. Like, I'm like, oh, I, I don't know, do I have enough to last that 40 minutes? And, and good, like, like, really solid, yeah. valuable stuff to say. How's your, how's your crowd work? 
Oh, that's that's my best. See, I I would love, I would love to do a TV show. My my favorite element, like I like being on tel- television, but I also like live, and I think that my experience being in front of a live audience for you know twenty plus years, and my experience being on television, like it's a it's a unique kind of hybrid situation. Mm-hmm. I thrive off of that interaction and that live response, so. If there was a scenario, I would jump all over that to be doing a television show that was also live. Um, and, and the Q&A part. In fact, a lot of times when people reach out to me and say, you know, would you come and speak or whatever? I'm always tempted to say, you know what we should do? I've never done this. But really what people should do is say, open with five minutes, tell people who you are, what you're about, and then Q&A. Especially for somebody who they watch on television or they've got a little bit of context about who they are. Mm. People want to ask questions. And from Mm. that, you can riff for, you could spend the next four hours answering questions. We never have enough time. It's my favorite part, hands down. Um, But, you know, you you come in, I, I probably have like two and a half hours worth of, you know, presentation. I'm always like, they're like at the back going, (laughs) <laughs> we're, we're done it's like an hour and 20 minutes we got to move on but that i think that's where people get value from though right because you're probably your 40 minute speech is just generic if you're talking about renovations it's like this is who you need to work with these are things to look out for yeah but, i mean but people in their mind are thinking yeah i i did all that i know all that yeah, or i but have this is my problem exactly what did you do when exactly. or whatever yeah i mean that's that's where the gold is. And then you can have fun with people and make fun of them and all that kind of good stuff and make people laugh. You should do a live podcast. Start a podcast. Yeah. So how would that work? Talk to this guy. He knows. It's been done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Joe Rogan's are live. Are they? He, did, he does it from YouTube. He does all of them live on YouTube. Really? Yeah. Ooh. But here's the difference with Joe Rogan is that he's already broken down the barrier of full disclosure. Like, like he's, right. he, his brand is already about, I've got no boundaries. Yeah. Am, would that be fair to say? For sure. 100%. So. Yeah. So you have to train your audience and your employers that that is what you're about. And you also have to make a decision whether that's how, um, raw you want to be for sure not only emotionally but also you know other content (laughs) for sure i think that's the exciting part but this is my personality that i don't really need to hide anything right (laughs) i have nothing to hide right so i i enjoy that part of it like i said carl's asked me if i wanted things edited out of podcasts before yeah like absolutely not why would it why would the real stuff be edited Right. To me, that is what a podcast is for. Yeah. Be real. It's a great question. Like, is there something to hide? Is that why you're holding back? And I understand, like, your situation may be different under contract with a network or yeah, and you've family got, like, stuff. You've got a, like, yeah. a, uh, what do they call it? Like a, not a disclosure, um, confidentiality yeah, agreements yeah. and stuff like that, where you're like, am I allowed to say this? Because, uh, you know, like. Or even your, family stuff. Yeah, like family. if your wife says something to you that she thinks is confidential. Yeah. And someone or asks you a question that, that is relevant. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you, you do. I mean, if you do that, you might want to go down the path of like being on The Bachelor. Like you have to decide where you yeah. want to sit with this information. Sure. Um, yeah. Fun world. It is. I'm excited. Very addicting. See, we should just we should set up a location. You should use it sometimes, and I'll use it sometimes. Then we don't we don't have to like. We've been talking about it. Double up. Yeah. You just want to use my equipment. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little tight on cash these days. Uh, can I sublet your your equipment? <laughs> I'll contract Carl out to you. Yeah. I'll hey, listen. That. Yeah. All of a sudden, he's making it. You, all of a sudden, I'm paying double. <laughs> <laughs> man, Carl is good, but man, he's expensive. <laughs> All right, let's get out of here. All right, let's go. Ty, that was a blast. Thanks, Thanks for, for having uh, me. Coming on, it was great to connect. I hope, I hope it was uh, there was something valuable in there. I think there was some value in there. 
Cheers. Good. Thanks, man. Thanks for the beer. Absolutely.